Right, so. Um, so yeah, we're just going to go through some of the basic concepts of oncology. Obviously, most of this isn't relevant to your curriculum because you do it all in fourth year. So in your exams, all you really get about oncology is possibly some oncology emergencies. Um, you might get a few things in your image exam if they're feeling mean. Um, you, you, a lot of the stuff that we're going to cover in this though, will be relevant to F1 and will be relevant to other exam questions that you'll get. So, first of all, basic concepts. I'm not going to go through everything that you should ask in a history of somebody's got cancer or come in with a new cough or whatever. I'm just going to go through the stuff that should make you think about cancer. So any patient that comes to you with any presentation, if they've got bleeding, you should think about cancer. And by bleeding, I mean things like um, hematemesis, um, hemoptysis, especially if they're coming with some sort of chest sign as well. Um, you need to, for things like hemoptysis, you need to have ca cancer as kind of a primary diagnosis. It's cancer until it's proven otherwise, especially if you've got something like a cough or something. Um, and things like hematuria as well, that's another one that you should have cancer in your mind, especially if it's painless. Um, cancer should be your primary diagnosis until you exclude it. Um, obviously, unless you've just had a catheter put in or something. Um, blood clots, really common presentation to A&E, really common in MAU. You'll be there in like a few months' time. You'll be the person clocking them in. Um, you need to get to the bottom of whether it's the first presentation why they're having blood clots. You should just always be asking why, and you'll be really thorough in your history if you do. Why they've got a blood clot? Have they got anything that will cause it? Have they got any risk factors? Uh, what's their age? Are they fat? Have they been on holiday? Um, have they had them before? If they have had them before, how recently? Is it likely to be because they've got cancer, possibly? Have they got any other symptoms? Just be really thorough in your history, and that will kind of bring you to your cancer possible diagnosis. Weight loss is another one. I think that's a bit more classic and something that you definitely think about. If someone comes to you with weight loss, you think about cancer. Um, focal neurology and seizures. Even in people that... So this will be another thing you see loads of in MAU. Loads of people that have come in with either like the first bit or they've got known epilepsy and they've had another seizure. But don't just assume. You need to be really thorough and just check that there's nothing else going on. Um, and quite often as well... You, in MAU, you'll see people who have got known cancer that they're being treated for and then they've come in with a seizure and that should definitely make you think about intracranial malignancy or metastasis. Um, and then any persistent symptoms, so anything that's been going on for a long time that they've just kind of put off, seen those lovely cough adverts that they've started putting on TV, anything like that, any headache, any constipation, any diarrhea, anything that's just gone on and on and they've not seen anybody about think about cancer and then examination you guys are probably the only people that will find stuff that the patient doesn't tell you about because you're the only ones that will examine really thoroughly um, so an example we had a patient in MEU the other day she came in she was just generally unwell she would had a fall family were just worried that she'd had a couple of falls there's nothing really when I examined her she got three massive lumps in her tummy but no, nobody else probably would have even noticed because they probably wouldn't have even bothered examining it because it's a fall, what's it got to do with the stomach, you know? So you just have to be really thorough to find cancer. Right, um, so investigation. If you were suspecting somebody had cancer, what blood test would you want to do? Yeah, you want to yet? Yeah, anything else in your full blood count that you'd want to have a look at? Sorry. Yeah, exactly. So it doesn't just tell you about their hemoglobin, it tells you about all the different components of the blood. So are they neutropenic? What are their platelets like? Um, basically, if, if anything's low in somebody that you're suspecting cancer, you need to refer them to oncology, um, whether that be acute oncology or a specific specialty if you've got some cancer in mind. Um, is it a marrow infiltration? What investigations do you need to do to figure out whether they've got really extensive cancer and the reason why their blood count's really low is because they've got it everywhere or have they got a hematological malignancy or something? Um, any other blood tests you want to do? It's really simple. I, kn I know you guys know this, so just try. 
Yeah, what are you doing you need for? Yeah, you're going to potentially give these patients chemotherapy drugs and lots of other exciting things that are going to knock their renal function off. Um, and I suppose as well, it kind of gives you a good, their renal function gives you a good idea of what their kind of baseline function is like as well, what comorbidities they've, they've got, have they got awful renal function, they're on dialysis, are you going to, how far are you going to investigate the patient possibly as well, it can give you a clue to anything else, any other blood tests, yeah, what's that for, yeah, really good, yeah, really good, so if, obviously if anything's abnormal in your LFTs, you might then go on to do some more investigation of that and see if there's any metastasis or lumps in there or anything. Um, any other blood tests that are useful in diagnosis but also might be useful a bit later? A bit more specific? What, oh, sorry? Yeah, that's a good one as well. Um, that'll tell you again about metastasis anywhere. Um, anything else more specific? Yeah, tumour markers. So they're not so, they're not so useful in diagnosis because they're not really very specific. Um, but they can be useful as kind of the disease progresses and you start to treat it and stuff. So it's a good one to do early-ish. Um, I, I, I personally wouldn't do tumour markers in anybody unless somebody more senior than me asked me to do them because it's just a dangerous thing to enter into to start doing tumour markers. Even things like PSA and things, unless you've got a strong suspicion that they've got prostate malignancy, you're suddenly overly, over-investigating everybody. So just be careful about who you do them on but um, and then this is kind of more relevant to leave and to actual F1 referral is really important I think it's something that you don't really get taught about in med school um, just something to really be aware of in cancer because obviously you don't want these people to kind of fall through the net and get lost in the system and you get sued two weeks into your first job um, just make sure that they get referred to somebody. If you don't know where the cancer is and you think it might be cancer, it's acute oncology in Leeds. There's a proper kind of consultant assigned to the team and they do everything for you pretty much, tell you exactly what to do. And if you do know who it is, you're referring to the specialty and you have to do an MDT referral as well, which you have to phone through and fax the referral in this trust. I'm sure in some places it's electronic or something easier. Um, there is, there is a couple, of, in B1, you can see like a couple of J waves as well, which you get in hypothermia usually. It's characteristic of hypothermia, but you do get it in hypercalcemia as well. Um, okay, management, really easy. As an F1, you're literally just going to give your patient some fluids, and then you're going to talk to a senior. You're not going to do any of the other stuff by yourself, I doubt very much, unless you're feeling very, very confident. Um, if it's, high, if it's very high, which this is, you can give them a single dose of bisphosphonate and you can kind of do, you can do that without contact with you know, and it's all in the BNF, how much you should give, what levels. Um, the main management though is just going to be managing the underlying malignancy in whatever way that is, whether they get sent for chemotherapy or radiotherapy or whatever. You can consider giving calcitonin, but you're probably not going to be the person doing that again. Um, got upgoing planted. So yeah, it's not it's not massively important clinically to distinguish these because if you've got any of these symptoms you'll just be sending your patient for an MRI anyway and treating them. So but it's useful for you guys to know and vaguely understand why if you remember your neuroanatomy. So yeah, so if you've got spinal cord compression you get up and motion neuron signs, brisk reflexes, um, and your immune continent. And that's obviously because the lesion's above the synapse with your lower motor neuron. Um, and then obviously in the cord equina, your upper motor neurons ended quite a lot before in your spinal cord, so you get lower motor neuron signs. So management, discuss with the senior. Um, high dose steroids, radiotherapy, or surgical decompression. Um, but this is pretty much one that if you're the F1, you'll be handing over to somebody more senior than you. Okay, 75-year-old um, male, known non-small cell, 
presents A and E with a new strider and shortness of breath, and that's what it looks like. Yeah, exactly. That would be your primary diagnosis: um, superior vena cava obstruction. Um, so this one again is not one that is massively an F1 kind of presentation. Something you should know about through exams. Um, local pressure from tumor thrombus, usually caused by the bronchial carcinoma or lymphoma, anything that compresses kind of the mediastinum. Um, and main management is chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So obviously you guys aren't doing that. Because obviously even though you've got a cause for your, your seizure, which is your low, so, your low sodium, it could be anything else causing it and it could just be a secondary kind of finding. Um, so, I'm not going to go through all of this, but this is basically how you decide what's causing your hyponatremia. Um, and in this patient, because he's got a known cancer, it's most likely cause, although obviously we don't know because we don't have any results, um, is, a, is SIADH. And that's, in many ones, has got kind of significant illness, whatever. It, it, there's loads of causes of SIADH, so look them up. Um, but cancer's a big one. So in SIADH, so management of hyponatremia, this is more. Um, so if it's really severe, usually what you want to do, you don't want to increase your sodium too quickly um, because it can cause cerebral pontine myelinosis, and obviously that's not ideal. Um, so usually what you do is increase their sodium level quite steadily. Um, but if it's very severe, as it is in this man, they're having seizures, um, you aim to increase it initially quite quickly just so you get them past the seizure threshold and kind of get them neurologically stable and then go for really steady um, resuscitation. So if they're normovolemic, which this patient probably would be, um, fluid restriction is your first line treatment. Um, and then if you need a little bit more help that's not really working very well, you can give them oral sodium replacement. Um, in the, in like the literature and online, you'll see it says hypertonic 3% saline, but we n almost never actually use that. Um, it's just because it's such a high sodium percentage, it's a bit risky. Um, so what we tend, well, what we always do, we never use 3% saline, I've never seen it used before, um, is try the other ones first. Um, if they're hypovolemic, you can give them normal saline, which, as I'm sure you already know, is more, saline, more salt than you require in a day anyway. So you can get somebody's sodium levels up quite quickly. You'd be surprised how many people you see are hypernatremic just because I've had a few too many bags of saline. Um, and then if they're hypervolemic, you can give them freezamide as well, which, as you know, decreases your potassium, increases your sodium. Okay. So, case five, 35 year old lady presents to acute oncology unit um, with a temperature of 38.9 and feeling generally unwell one week after chemotherapy. So, really classical history, what do you think the possible diagnosis might be? Yes, exactly, neutropenic sepsis. Um, so, with anybody who's septic, what do you normally want to do? So, and anybody on, and you'll get this all the time next year you will be the, the scapegoat for people with temperatures of 38. You'll get phoned, if you start on surgery, it'll be a nightmare because you get phoned about 500 times a night for somebody with temperature 38. And you just get so sick of it. You're like, oh, that's fine. I'm happy with anyone who's less than 38.5. Um, so it's something to really have in your head what you're gonna do for a patient like this. What was that, sorry? Yeah, sepsis six, actually. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, blood cultures, what else? Catheter, yeah, what's your catheter for? Yeah, exactly. Um, anything else? Yeah, yeah, great, exactly. Um, and in Leeds, they use buffalo. I don't know why, but yeah. Um, so, no sepsis, um, definition it will it will generally help you as well because you can and you can figure out quite quickly once you start working you'll realize which patients you're worried about and which patients you're not worried about and you can't I know 
the end of the bed test is, al is always a really good test, but you can't always go on that because some people look really, really well and you're not worried about them at all. And the next day you come and see them, they've completely gone off within like half an hour of you seeing them or something worse. So don't just rely on kind of peering at your patients. Yeah, so sex at six. She said, very good. Um, so here's six. 12-year-old, receiving chemotherapy for acute lymphoblastic leukemia, comes generally unwell, reduced urine output, and complaining of tingling in the lips and general weakness. <coughs> Any differentials? Yeah, it could be. You've got kind of got symptoms that might suggest some electrolyte abnormality. Um, any other? What's that? Yeah, possibly, yeah. Anything else? Could be, yeah. It's quite, it's quite possible, isn't it? Lots of people are allergic to chemotherapy agents. They're so harsh or at least sensitive to them. Um, anything else quite quite um, important not to miss in somebody with this symptom sign could just be renal failure with the complications of that reduce your output in a child and think about what their kidney is doing um, so this is what their bloods look like um, potassium, what's wrong with it? Yeah, it's a little bit high. Um, would you want to do anything about it? I personally wouldn't bother doing an ECG. If it was a 12 year old, I might do because I'd probably be a bit more careful. But um, if that was an adult, that's very, very mild and that's that's just something that you could monitor. Maybe with the other things as well, you might think about doing an ECG. But if that was the only, if it was only the potassium, I probably wouldn't bother. A potassium about six, you might do an ECG usually, just to make sure that they've only got mild hypercalcemia for them. Calcium, what's wrong with it? Yeah. Phosphate. a little bit high. I wouldn't have known either last year. Um, right, so yeah, it's tumor, it's tumor lysis syndrome. I should have asked you, yeah. Um, so really common hematological malignancy and complications of renal failure. So that's why you've got you reduce urine output. Um, so management, what you'll be doing, giving them lots of lots of fluids, that's where you'll start. Replace any electrolytes, which you would do in anybody with low electrolytes. Um, so the the people that you see mostly with electrolyte abnormalities are people that we're feeding artificially, um, elderly people or people with things like this. And usually the rule is just replace it because you never know what's going on in the body. And if you replace it orally, usually the body kind of balances how much it needs quite effectively anyway. And then you can give them acetazolamide and allopurinol, but I don't think as an F1 you'll be doing that. Somebody might give them that. Um, so we're just going to do some images now. I just want to shout out the diagnosis. Cancer. Yeah, good guess. <laughs> what kind of cancer? It, it could be an adenocarcinoma. If you figure that out from that, that's amazing. You might need to biopsy it first, but it could be an adenocarcinoma. <laughs> um, where, what part of the body is this, is more what I meant. Yeah, so probably bowel cancer. Um, and what's that sign called? Yeah, great. Um, what, what investigation have they done? A bearing what? what? Which one is it? Which one is it? 
Yeah, it's Enema. Yeah, obviously. Well, and which tumor marker would be helpful? Yeah, CEA, great. Um, what's the diagnosis? Anyone? Oh, I heard it. Who said that? Yeah, I don't know who said it, but someone said it. Acoustic neuroma, yeah. Which nerves are affected? I need to look this up because I can't remember. Seven, yeah. Any others? Eight, yeah. Any others? Five, yeah, exactly. Um, what's this clinical finding? What was that, sorry? Yeah, Horner's syndrome. Um, and what malignancy might you be thinking about if you saw somebody with this? There's one that is really commonly quoted. There's loads that can cause it, though. What was that, sorry? Yeah, I'm close to you, yeah. Sorry. Okay, um, so what's this lesion? Yeah, basal cell carcinoma. And you can tell because um, they do look quite, I found this quite difficult to get my head around when I was doing dermatology for final because some, some basal cells look really different, but in general they look like, um, like an ulcer. They have like a rolled edge and in the middle they're kind of usually a bit scabby and horrible. Um, this, is ge this is generally what they look like, but some of them look a bit funny. Um, and how do you manage it? You can cut it off. Is there anything else you can do? You can do cryotherapy as well. Um, so what's the finding on x-ray? Yeah, pepper pot skull. And what's your possible differential, bearing in mind it's an oncology lecture? Yeah. Um, what is a likely diagnosis? Yeah, very good. Um, it is, it is, I know people go on about this, that when you're doing your chest, you're doing chest x-rays, your OSCE or whatever, your image exam or whatever, you need to say, right, middle low, blah, blah, but it will be really important when you start work as well, just to make sure that you're not sending people for chemotherapy, the wrong lung or anything exciting. Um, what further investigations might you want to do to get a more definitive diagnosis? Yeah, bronchoscopy and biopsy, yeah. You could also do a CT scan just to kind of get an idea of how extensive it is. Um, yeah, that's everything.